Now here's the part of the lesson that shocks a lot of people. Friends, can I make an appeal? Let's agree right now that we're going to go by what God's Word says. Is that fair? Let's get our information not from the National Enquirer or from some out-of-body experience somebody had, but let's find out what the Bible says. The book of Revelation pictures three angels speeding to our planet. They carry urgent messages of warning and hope to prepare us for Jesus' return. These divine prophecies provide us with a vivid window revealing future events for our world. In God's Word, a special blessing is promised for all who seek to understand these prophecies. With this in mind, Amazing Facts brings you a new revelation with Doug Batchelor. Author and TV host Doug Batchelor has thrilled thousands around the world with these fascinating presentations. This new Revelation seminar is a complete Bible study the whole family will enjoy. Clear-cut logic, spontaneous humor, and beautifully illustrated study guides will bring the Bible to life as never before. Today's message, Are the Dead Really Dead? And now, a new Revelation. Heavenly Father, it is our privilege to be here tonight in your presence. Tonight, we pray not only will our minds and our hearts be open, but we pray that you'll be with Doug and that you'll touch his heart and his lips in a way that, that he will be able to speak to us and we will sense your presence and rejoice in what you are leading us to believe and to become is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. Good to see everybody. And we're looking forward to our study tonight. I want to welcome those who are worshiping with us at home to our seminar. And we're going to uh, get into some Bible questions. I want to thank Pastor Dave for helping each night. We have a good stack. And tonight we're going to do our best. To... A lot of good questions came in last night. You know, I almost wish we could take one of our nights off and meet and just do Bible questions during the night because uh, there's so many questions that I want to answer, we just don't have time for them all. But we're going to go through in machine gun form. The questioner is 14 years old and is wanting to know, is having a crush on someone a sin? Is it wrong to have a crush on someone? You know, as you begin to mature, your emotional love muscles start to exercise and you become attached uh, I had a crush on one of my teachers in fourth grade. Never forgot her, Mrs. Morinci. She beat me arm wrestling and I was in love. <laughs> and, um, you know, I got over it. Uh, at the time, you think you're going to die if you can't spend the rest of your life with this person. Of course, there was about a 10-year age difference and it wasn't very realistic. Um, try to control your heart's affections. Now, is it wrong to have a crush on a person? Well, it's not wrong to be attracted to somebody, but we did talk last night about being careful to guard your thoughts so you don't start daydreaming with impure thoughts that are not appropriate. And that's where it would border into the realm of being a sin. Does God still create angels today? There's no record that God is still creating angelic ministering spirits. We don't know. The Bible is silent on that. Could you please talk some more about dating, sex, etc.? Just make sure you get them in the right order. Um, I don't know if we're going to get to it. Someone else asked. A lot of questions came in. I could have talked three hours on our subject last night. Uh, a lot of questions came in dealing with dating and sex. And someone asked a question. We've been dating. We're looking forward to marriage. We're having a hard time controlling our urges. Should we marry so that we don't uh, you know, make that mistake? Well, you know, the Bible makes a statement that's sometimes hard to interpret. It says it's better to marry than burn. And Paul seems to say that in the context that if a person is burning with passion and desire, uh, you know, those desires are created by God to be fulfilled within the confines of a Christian marriage. And so I wouldn't rush into a marriage just so you can satisfy those desires because I tell you what, uh, if that's all your marriage is built on, that evaporates pretty fast. You better have some uh, firm footing. That's like buying a house because someone sprayed air fragrance in it just before you went in to look at it. I mean, that stuff's going to go away. So you want to make sure that... Uh, and you know what? The Lord may be strengthening your relationship for the future by controlling your urges while you're dating. 
If you've got self-control while you're dating, you're on the right road for success when you're finally married. Amen? I have committed adultery. I am no longer involved. But your booklet number five says, I will pay the supreme penalty and will have a shadow settle over me. Does this mean I will never be saved? Am I as bad as the fallen angel? Well, I hope no one is interpreting that the study guide is saying when you commit adultery, it's the unpardonable sin. That's not in there. Though it is true that when you commit adultery, it does leave a permanent shadow on your life in this world. It's just a fact. That though God forgives sin, I hope we all know sin leaves scars. And the thief on the cross who said, Lord, remember me, Jesus said, I'll remember you. He didn't pop off the cross and walk away. He stayed there to suffer for his sins. And so sin does have consequences. And adultery has terrible consequences. And so, yes, you can be forgiven. There's a lot of records in the Bible, including King David, who was forgiven for adultery. But look at the consequences he paid. You read that story, four of his children were lost because of that specific sin. And so I'm hoping everyone knows that the blood of Christ is sufficient to save from the uttermost to the guttermost. He, there, he can reach. His arm is not shortened. He can save us. He can forgive us. But sin does have consequences in this life, and if it's unforgiven, in the judgment. What are the seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns on the beast of Revelation 17? We have a lesson on that. I included the question just so you'll know we're not ignoring these things. We have a lesson coming on the beast. Where did the tradition of kneeling when we pray come from? Kneeling during prayer is not a tradition. It is in the Bible. When you, your, your, your body language, when you talk to each other, sometimes tells how you're listening. What does it mean when you're telling someone what your point of view is and they fold their arms and look away? What does that mean? They're not listening. They don't agree. They're take, taking a stand. Body language is important in communication. When you bow your head and when you kneel, it's a symbol of submission. And kneeling during prayer is very biblical. It represents submission to God and his authority. Why didn't God just kill Lucifer and end the sin problem right there in heaven? That's a good... You, are you all able to hear the questions for the most part? Um, that's a good question. Why didn't God just wink his eye and snap his finger and obliterate Lucifer as soon as he sinned? First of all, did God have the power to do that? He can do that. Can he do it now? Why doesn't he do it? Very simple. God is what? Love. Does God want his creatures to obey him? Because if they do not obey, he's going to snuff them out, rub them out. Does a parent want their children to obey because if the children do not listen, the parent's going to throw them against the wall? That would mean all the creatures in the universe, first of all, would be motivated by fear if God did that. Secondly, they'd be thinking within themselves, hey, you know, Lucifer made some accusations about God and his love and government. Maybe he was right. There would forever be doubts in their mind on God's truth, justice, love, and goodness. God had to allow Lucifer to demonstrate what would be the result of rebellion against God so that it will never happen again. It's a terrible, painful experiment, but it's the only way that God can let people know that he is love. So he did not just kill Lucifer. He allowed the whole universe to see. And this earth is the theater for the universe right now. If you smoke pot, will you go to hell? Well, it can end up that way, but you'll certainly be stupid. I used to smoke pot pot and that's the one thing I remember is it really makes you stupid uh, started smoking pot with my mother when I was 13 and you'll sit there for 10 minutes and stare at the remote control and not remember how to operate it or we'd smoke pot I remember one time I was at a party we got done smoking pot and I stared at my tennis shoe it was untied and I couldn't remember how to tie it so you know why would you want to do something like that uh, most of us struggle when our senses are working why would you want to per deliberately handicap your faculties. So, is it a sin? Well, your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. And smoking pot, kind of like putting graffiti in the temple. It just doesn't make sense. Does God really care which day we keep? Romans 13, 10 says, Love is the fulfilling of the law. And Galatians 5, 14, For all the law is fulfilled in one, one word, Thou shalt love the Lord, uh, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Don't we just have to love? 
<laughs> well, yes, we have to love. But when you love, does that mean when you really love the way God wants you to love, you keep the law less or you keep it better? When you really love your neighbor, do you say, well, I just, I really love my neighbor, and so now I'm free to take his possessions or lie to him? I really love God, and so now I can use his name in vain and worship other gods? No, when you really love, you keep the law more carefully because you love. That's why love is the fulfilling of the law. In other words, the better you love God, the better you obey him. That's why Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so, yes, love is the fulfilling of the law. According to Genesis, the sun and moon were created on the fourth day of creation week. If this is true, how could there be day and night on the first three days? How many of you have wondered this before? God says the evening and the morning were the first day, yet he didn't make the sun until the fourth day. How can that work? When God first came to this orb that was void and without form, he said, let there be light. What was the light? The Bible says God is light. In him is no darkness at all. As the Lord approached this planet and he set it in motion, he was the light. He was the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. And so he was the separation of day and night for those first three days. Then he created a more artificial means, the sun and the moon and the stars. But God, I believe, himself divided the day and night in the beginning. If time is dated from Christ's birth, why was he born 4 B.C. and not zero? I knew we'd get that question. You may, remember I shared the other day in our lesson on the second coming that Jesus was born four years before Christ. That's, that sounds like another oxymoron, doesn't it? We were in the back a little while ago talking about some other oxymorons. We heard some really good ones. Government productivity. <laughs> politically correct. Black light. <laughs> How could Jesus be born 4 B.C.? Well, after this dating method, you see, before they established the A.D., B.C. dating method, and A.D. doesn't stand for after death. It stands for Anno Domini, year of our Lord. Before they established that, all history was dated from the different reign, reigning periods of monarchs and priests, and it was very confusing. It'd be in the third year of the reign of Babylon's king was a different year of the reign of this king. You ever read Chronicles and Kings? It's very confusing, the dating method. So they decided to date all history from the birth of Christ. They did their best to calculate that date, and they came up with that date, and they called it the year zero. Well, several years after it was universally accepted as the dating method, they found out they were four years off. One reason they found out is they, they dug up some artifacts and found some Roman history. King Herod the Great, that had all the babies in Bethlehem killed, he died between 2 and 3 B.C. We know he tried to have Jesus killed, and so Jesus had to be born before he died. And so they finally pinpointed the date of Christ's birth for about 4 B.C. What happens if you've gone too far before marriage? What do you do? Well, you, you can agree, if you're not married yet, if you can agree with the person you're dating or courting that this isn't appropriate and do not allow yourself to get in a situation where you will be tempted again. For one thing, a lot of young people get into trouble doing things they never planned on doing because they start flipping switches and pulling buttons that are designed to lead to sex. And, you know, you get alone. If there's witnesses around, people behave a lot better. Keep plenty of witnesses. You get alone and you start kissing and touching and pretty soon the hormones begin to rage and it's very hard to know how far is too far and when to stop and the next thing you know, you're sorry. And so don't get in those situations. And, you know, you can regain your integrity and dignity and self-respect by agreeing with the person you're dating, we've made a mistake, pray to God, Lord forgive us, accept his forgiveness, and then don't do it again. Amen? Repent and be sorry enough to stop. Is it wrong to have tattoos? No, as long as they're not on your body. <laughs> the Bible tells us that your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit, like I just said. I mean, you wouldn't go and let a, a group of uh, a, a gang loose in the temple of God with spray paint to express themselves, would you? The Bible says you are not to make markings or cuttings in your flesh, for you are the temple of God. And that would, of course, include tattoos. Now, if you've already got tattoos, and a lot of people I've uh, worked with who have accepted Jesus have been covered with tattoos. I was in England a few years ago, and I saw this young man about 18 years old. He had shaved his whole head on one side, and he tattooed 
all the way from this part of his face over, the, his whole head. And I thought, oh, that poor kid. You know, what he thinks is cool now is going to haunt him for the rest of his life. And, and I would appeal to all of you who are here and all of my friends listening, I could just tell you list after list of friends who on an impulse got a tattoo and then regretted it for the rest of their lives. And they can remove them, but not without leaving some scars, you know. And so don't do that. You know, if you love someone, write them a letter. Don't put it on your arm or your forehead. Is it right or wrong, and how does God feel about people who speak in tongues? It's called getting or being slain. Is that this right or wrong? Well, that, that's something, two different things. Being slain in the spirit, you've probably seen on TV some of the services where the minister touches a person and they fall down. And speaking in tongues is not always associated with that. Now, I believe in all the gifts of the spirit, including speaking in tongues. I do not agree with or believe in all of the manifestations you see that in Christian churches today. I think the devil has a counterfeit for every truth of God. And there's a lot of things going on in the name of the Lord that Peter, James, John, and the apostles never participated in. I don't remember Jesus ever slapping someone on the head and having them fall down. <laughs> Our study tonight is dealing with, are the dead really dead? Now, how are you doing your lessons? I want to encourage you, look over your lesson, look at the scriptures before you come, because I'm not covering all of it. And I'm hoping that you'll get the additional information in the lesson, plus what I share in the lecture. Again, I want to remind our friends at home that you can order these lessons and study along with Pastor Doug. The information is at the end of the broadcast, and you can write that down at that time. Question number one. In order to understand something about what happens when someone dies, we might need to take a look at what happens when someone lives. How did we get here in the first place? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 tells us, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, man is a combination of the elements of the earth and the breath of life. That word for breath of life in Hebrew, roach, is sometimes translated spirit. It's the same word. In Greek, it's the word pneuma. It means wind, breath. You've heard of pneumatic tools, pneumatic tires have got air in them. Pneumonia is a disease that's supposed to come from an ill wind, trouble breathing. Well, that word pneuma is often translated spirit in the New Testament. And some people think that means it's a ghost, a little spirit inside of you. And it means the breath of life or the power of life that God gives us, okay? Now, I think it's important for us to understand this. You already know that when you die, you've heard the funeral service, and it's in the Bible, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. When a person dies, the reverse takes place. When a person dies, the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Now, somebody's going to ask me, I think I already saw the question, is it appropriate or is it wrong for Christians to be cremated? It, does the Bible say you need to be buried? Well, you know, the Bible doesn't really address it. Most of the time it says he was buried with his fathers. And, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were buried in the cave of Machpelah. But it's not a sin to be cremated because, you know, if a person's buried and you go dig up the remains a hundred years later, they've turned into dust. If a person's cremated, it's just accelerating the same decomposition process. I've told Karen, just find out what the specials are and go for that. Because... Think about it. Now, some people get really worried. They think, well, but I want to get resurrected. And if the Lord comes back and I've been cremated and scattered on the ocean, he's going to look around and say, I can't find the parts and just going to give up. <laughs> I mean, come on, friends. God is not going to make you out of the old parts, is he? God's going to have a whole new program with you on it. And I'm getting a new body when he comes back. I don't want any part of this mortal body. I want an immortal body. So don't be too concerned about what happens with this body. Um, it's really expensive to get buried these days. You know, I just heard in Alabama, a cemetery just raised their prices due to the cost of living. <laughs> that sounds backwards to me. And I don't think there's anything wrong with a Christian choosing to allow their organs in the event that they should die in an accident to be used to, to help or bless somebody else. Amen. Because it's, you're not going to get the, new, the old body, you're getting a new body. If you take care of this one, you can trade it in on a newer model when Jesus comes. 
Number three, what is the spirit that returns to God at death? Now, some people think, see, Doug, when a person dies, the body turns to dust, but the ghost, the soul, returns to God who gave it. It does not say that. You know, in the Bible, when it says the spirit returns to God who gave it, it does not even distinguish between the good and the bad. It does not even distinguish there in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 between animal and human. It's talking about the spirit of all living creatures returns to God who gave it. In other words, the breath of life returns to God who gave it. Some people read this at funerals and they think that that means their soul suddenly was ushered up to God. The Bible very clearly distinguishes between body, soul, and spirit are three distinct things. Would you like to see a soul? Now, you've got to cooperate. How many of you would like to see a soul? I can show you one right now. All right, everybody, close your eyes. You don't trust me. You're watching. I see you looking at me. <laughs> close your eyes. Okay. Now, you've got to tune in with your alpha brain levels. If you sense there is another living being, close your eyes. If you sense there's another living being around you, without opening your eyes, slowly turn your head in that direction with your eyes closed. Okay, when I count to three, open your eyes. One, two, three. Boo, that's a soul. <laughs> you are a soul. The God, Bible tells us there that God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. The combination of the breath of life and the elements of earth equal a soul. It's as though I have here some nails and some wood. I take the nails and I take the wood and I assemble them and I suddenly have a box. When I remove the nails and put them over here and I remove the pieces of wood and put them over here, where's the box? Well, it ceases to be a box when you separate the two. You cease to be a soul when you separate the breath of life with the elements of earth. The spirit of life returns to God who gave it. In other words, it's the power of life. See, the Jews actually had it right. There is no life in the world without air. All creatures in this world, fish breathe, birds breathe, worms breathe through their skin. Leaves, plants breathe. The same breath that a bear breathes, you breathe, and a cat and a dog breathes. And when the breath of life is gone, you're dead. The breath, the power of life returns to God who gave it. We've got all these different appliances in this building that are operating on electricity. If we kill the power, they all go dead. Where'd the power go? Back to the wall, where it came from. Or back to the generator, where it came from. This is what God is telling you. It's not saying that when you die, suddenly a little butterfly or ghost jumps out of you and runs off to the Lord. You're sleeping, awaiting the resurrection. Number four, what is a soul? And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a soul. Does it say that God gave him a soul? No. It says he became a soul. The combination of those two things equaled a soul. Man became a living soul. Number five, do souls die? Now, how many of you have heard people say or sing or preach about how we all have an immortal soul? Come on, you've heard that. Show me where in the Bible, I'll wait, it says that man has an immortal soul. Got several hundred people here. Someone must know the scripture that says we have an immortal soul. It's not in the Bible. Matter of fact, if you look in the Bible, you'll find it tells us God and God only hath immortality. God is the only one who's immortal. God gives you immortality when Jesus comes and you get your glorified immortal body. Amen? Until that time, we're mortal. Mortal means you die and I die. Mort immortality is a gift that comes when Jesus comes and gives us our new bodies. The Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Every living soul in the sea died. Revelation chapter 16, verse 3. Even the souls of animals died. Friends, find a pen and take down our 800 number and mailing address. We have a wonderful free gift that goes right along with what you're seeing and hearing today. It's the beautifully illustrated complimentary study guide. Our operators are standing by for your call at 800-835-6906. Make certain you give the title of today's study when you phone. 
And by all means, write us at Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Look for this address again at the end of today's telecast. Offer good in the U.S., Canada, and U.S. territories. Friends, I think you know that a camera lens is a little impersonal. That's why I want to hear from you. I treasure each one of your cards, your letters, your words of encouragement, and your comments. We also appreciate your prayer requests. Our office staff gathers every day to pray over each one of them. The address is Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. God bless you, and I thank you in advance. Do good people go to heaven right when they die? What does the Bible teach on this? Now, here's the part of the lesson that shocks a lot of people. Friends, can I make an appeal? Let's agree right now that we're going to go by what God's Word says. Is that fair? Let's get our information not from the National Enquirer or from some out-of-body experience somebody had, but let's find out what the Bible says. Do people go right to heaven when they die or, or they, are they waiting for the resurrection? You know, well, first let me read the answer to this one. All that are in their graves will hear His voice and come forth. When? When Jesus comes. Acts chapter 2. Matter of fact, turn in your Bibles with me. Acts chapter 2, verse 29. I want to read some scriptures with you real quick. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher, his tomb, is with us unto this day. Now Nathan the prophet said to David, You will sleep with your fathers. Here we are, Peter is preaching on Pentecost. This is 50 days after the resurrection. David hasn't made it to heaven yet. He's either taken a slow train or he's still there in the grave. Now, was David good or bad, King David? Well, Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. We expect to see him in the kingdom. And here it says he's dead and buried. Turn down to verse 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens. Now, I don't know how more plain God's word can be. Good King David is dead, buried, not in heaven. Is that clear? The Bible tells us people sleep until the resurrection. They don't go right to heaven when they die. Some of you, well, let's look at another one. Go with me to 1 Corinthians. Let's read several real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's read verse 51. That's page 1688. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now, what is sleep a symbol of? What is Paul talking about? Death. We'll not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. Some of us will be alive when Jesus comes. Isn't that good news? I think you're living in that generation. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. When does it happen? The last trump. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. When? When the trumpet sounds. And will be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality. When do we get immortality? After the last trumpet. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, this body that corrupts and decomposes, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? That's another one, another verse I wanted to read here for you that I think I wrote down. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23. Turn back to 23. That's back a page. When does the resurrection take place? I like to get the context. Let's read verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Sleep is a symbol of death. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection. In other words, by man in Adam all die. We all are subject to death because we're mortal because of Adam's sin. So in Christ we shall all be made alive because he never sinned. But every man in their own order. Here's the order, friends. Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. When? At his coming. The Bible is so clear. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now I think I'm getting ahead of myself because this comes later in the lesson. But we got our Bibles open and I sure like for you to see this right out of God's word. Verse 16. Oh, let's read verse 13. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep. Stop right there. That's page 1736. Why am I talking about this? Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant regarding them that are asleep. Do not be ignorant regarding 
those that are dead. He wants us to understand this. I'll tell you why in just a moment. That you do not sorrow as others that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He'll bring them back to life when he comes. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, I hope that's you and me, friends, will not prevent those that are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. When do we start being with the Lord? When he comes. When is that happening? When he descends and the trumpet sounds and he shouts and there's a resurrection and we're caught up to meet him. Are people in heaven right now as soon as they die? No, the Bible is very clear they're sleeping. Now, some of you are thinking, what about that scripture that says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. You all remember that? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. See, Doug, as soon as a person dies, they're present with the Lord. Keep two things in mind. First of all, Paul speaks a great deal about living with the body or the spirit. Some people live for the flesh. Some people live for the spirit. Some people are carnally minded. Some people are spiritually minded. Those who are living for the body are not present with the Lord. That's one of the implications in what he's saying. Secondly, suppose Paul is saying, as soon as you die, you're present with the Lord. It's true. King David died 3,000 years ago. He died in a saved condition. He closed his eyes. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the next thing he's aware of is the trumpet. As soon as he is conscious again, he is present with the Lord. For him, it's going to seem like a second, not 3,000 years. So as far as your loved ones are concerned who have gone to sleep, the next thing they're conscious of is the resurrection with glorified bodies. Amen? But they're not going there right away. The Bible says we're all going together when the resurrection takes place. What good is a resurrection if people go right to heaven as soon as they die? And I hear, say, well, that's so God can come back and get their bodies and put the soul and the body together. You mean there are ghosts up there now? And he doesn't need to come back for the body. He can give them a body up there. They're getting a new body, right? It just doesn't make any sense. You know why we have a lesson on this? You walk around in a church cemetery, you'd be amazed how much confusion there is on the subject of death. Walk around in a church cemetery, and you'll read on the same tombstones, or the same church cemetery, different tombstones, one tombstone will say, Our dearly beloved mother departed, now singing with the angels, marching on golden streets. Beautiful poems. You ever read cemeteries? Some of them are very touching. You'll see a mother and the date of death is the same as the baby in the grave next to her. She evidently died giving birth or something. You can learn a lot just by walking through a cemetery. Then you go to another tombstone, and it will say, same church cemetery, it'll say, our beloved mother, sleeping sweetly in the arms of Jesus, waiting for the resurrection morn. People are confused. Where's mom? What happens when you die? Now, why does it matter that we understand this? When we get into Revelation a little more, which is coming right now, the Bible tells us that Satan and his angels can be transformed into messengers of righteousness. The Bible tells us how demons impersonated the prophet Samuel and deceived Saul and he died the next day. In the last days, tells us three unclean spirits in Revelation come out of the mouth of the beast, the dragon and the false prophet. They go forth to the leaders of the world performing miracles for the purpose of deceiving. Isn't it interesting? We've had a couple of presidents lately and their wives that are consulting astrologers and necromancers and mediums who talk to the dead. That's pretty scary, friends. You've got to know that the dead are dead or you can be deceived. They're sleeping. The Bible says they don't know anything. Heard about a lady in San Francisco. Her son was in Vietnam. She received one of those tragic messages during the Vietnam War that was delivered. We regret to inform you your son is missing in action and presumed dead. Well, she was devastated. She spent several days without leaving her apartment there in San Francisco. She had been a Christian. She prayed for her son that God would spare him every day because he was not a Christian. One day while she was in her room sobbing, her son appeared at the foot of her bed. She was, of course, shocked. She was feeling this mingling of emotions. She was happy to see her son, but at the same time, everything she had ever read in her Bible said that he was sleeping until the resurrection. And furthermore, her son was not even a Christian. 
And now he's appearing at the foot of her bed saying, Mom, I'm okay, I'm in heaven now. Everyone's going to make it eventually. The things in the Bible that talk about the destruction of the wicked in hell, they're just there to frighten people into being good. And he appeared to her several times and she was so twisted with emotion she didn't know what to think and she kept saying, this cannot be right. It's not according to the Bible. And, and uh, her son that appeared to her in these apparitions would say, well, the Bible has been changed by men. You cannot really trust it. That's what this ghost was saying to her that looked just like her son, talked just like her son. Then one day the doorbell rang, rang and her son is now appearing at the door. She said, why are you appearing here at the door? You're usually in the bedroom. And he said, what are you talking about? His arm was in a sling. It was her real son. He was alive. The devil's messed up somewhere in their database. <laughs> that was not her son that appeared at the foot of her bed. Something appeared. The devils are going to use this false understanding about what happens when you die to deceive people in the last days. And Christians need to know what the Bible teaches, that the living know they'll die, but the dead don't know anything. They're asleep. They're unconscious. Amen? The Bible says that they don't go to heaven until the resurrection. Number seven, how much does one know or comprehend after death? Answer, the living know they'll die. And this is found in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5 and 6. The living know they'll die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything done under the sun. In other words, in this life, they are not involved forever in this life. There is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. The dead do not praise the Lord. Psalm 115, verse 17. Isaiah says the same thing. It says the dead cannot praise you. Now, how clear can it be? That's incidentally Isaiah 38, verse 18 and 19, if you want more references. Look those things up. If people go right to be with the Lord and the Bible says the dead cannot praise the Lord, how do you reconcile that? First thing I'd do if I got to heaven is start praising God. How about you? They're asleep. Dreamless, unconscious sleep. But can't the dead communicate with the living, number eight? And aren't they aware of what the living are doing? I mean, you know, I remember I, I was married 50 years and then after I died, I couldn't decide whether or not to buy a Ford or a Chevrolet and my husband appeared to me and he said, buy a Chevy. You know, I've had people tell me things like this. Doesn't that mean they're alive and watching over me? I felt such comfort to know that my husband is watching over me. Well, let me explain. Did I get him? No, but I scared him real good. We've got all the flies coming in the building because we've had the windows open. And so uh, we've got to get them when we can. <laughs> I almost sent him to his reward. And he was about to know nothing. <laughs> you know, if someone's married 50 years, your mind is filled with memories of that person, right? And I've talked to dear Christian saints. And you know, usually the men go before the ladies. Of course, I knew one church member I took care of, Clyde Cochran. He lived to be 101. He married when he was 50 years old. He never dreamed he'd celebrate his 50th anniversary when he married at 50. And he outlived a couple of wives. But typically, the ladies outlive the men. Statistics tell us. And I know there's a lot of widows here and watching the program. And you've been married to someone a long time, and then they're gone, and you grieve for years because your mind is full of memories. And I had a lot of them tell me, you know, I'll turn around, I'll think they're there in the hall, I'll turn around to say something to them, and then I'll remember they're gone and they'll start crying again. It's normal, because of the way our minds are made, to sense a person being around when your mind is filled with them. All of my life, from the time I was born, I had an older brother named Falcon. Falcon and I were, he was my only brother, and my dad named us after aircraft. He was named Falcon, I was named Douglas after the DC craft. And uh, my brother died of cystic fibrosis when he was 35. Well, 35 years, or 32 years of my life, I could always pick up the phone and call Falcon. I had it in auto dial on my phone. And even two years after he died, one day I was flipping through my phone memory things and I saw Falcon. I said, oh, I haven't talked to Falcon. I pressed the number and picked up the phone to talk to him. And then I realized he had died. I had forgotten for a moment. And it was like he was there. Now, if he'd answered the phone, I would have been pretty scared. 
because I know that he doesn't know anything right now. We've got to understand this. And so you may have had feelings and dreams about a loved one that is there. Your mind is doing things. Maybe the Lord is allowing you to experience some comfort, but they're not conscious now in reality. Let's go by what God's Word tells us. Nine. Jesus calls the unconscious state of dead sleep. How long will they sleep? Now, do Christians die or do they just go to sleep? The Bible tells us Christians don't really die. They just go to sleep. We don't have to be afraid of death. The Bible says Jesus yielded up the spirit. He went to sleep. Stephen was stoned and he went to sleep. King David went to sleep. And we're going to wake up when Jesus comes. Amen? You don't have to be afraid. The world is afraid of death. Woody Allen said, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. But most of the world is really afraid. It's asleep. The Bible says in Job chapter 14, verse 12, Son of man, lie down and riseth not till the heavens be no more. When will he rise? When the heavens are no more. The day of the Lord will come in which the heavens pass away. When Jesus comes and the trumpet blasts, then the dead in Christ will rise. Number 10, what happens to the righteous dead at the second coming of Christ? Behold, I come quickly, Jesus tells us. My reward is with me to give to every man according to his work. The Bible says the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. The dead in Christ will rise. Turn with me to the Gospel of John in your Bibles, chapter 6. The Gospel of John, chapter 6. First of all, I think we all remember that when Jesus resurrected Lazarus, he said our friend Lazarus is doing what? He's sleeping. And I go to wake him. And then he told Martha, he said, I'm going to wake him up. And, and she said, well, I know he's going to rise again in the resurrection at the last day. That's page 1557. Verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, do you know in this same chapter, turn with me to verse 40. This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believeth on him, that seeth the, uh, believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up when? At the last day. I think no less than five times in the Gospel of John, Jesus tells us the resurrection is at the last day. Does that mean people die and go right to heaven? No. It's so clear if you read all the scriptures together. Now, somebody is going to write down. What about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus that seems to indicate people go right to heaven or hell when they die? Write it down. I'll answer that. Someone else is going to say, what about the thief on the cross? Doesn't the Bible say Jesus said, verily I say to you, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Well, you're going to have a problem when you go to the Gospel of John because Jesus didn't go to paradise that day. The Bible says Mary went to grab his feet and he said, do not touch me for I have not yet ascended to my father. So we'll have to take a closer look at that. Write it down. We'll try and deal with it. We'll answer all of these. I believe every scripture is inspired. We've got to search to know the truth. Amen? But I'll tell you, friends, it's worth it once we find the truth regarding these things. Number 11, what was the devil's first lie? And the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now think about this, friends. In the very beginning, God said to Eve, if you disobey me, you will die you will surely die. The devil said, you will not surely. Surely means completely die. Much of the Christian world is now echoing what the devil said. You don't really die. You go right to heaven or right to hell as soon as you die. How many of you have been to funerals before? I know I have, where people are being preached right into heaven, right there at the funeral. Sometimes it's confusing because you can see their bodies right there in the casket. And the minister saying, yes, they're up there now talking to Peter, James, and John, and Joseph, and they're dancing on golden streets, and you're looking at them. They don't look like they're doing anything. And they say, well, it's their soul that's up there right now. And a lot of this comes from paganism and Greek mythology that crept into the Roman teachings and later found its way into the Christian church. And we'll share more about that a little bit later. But the Bible's very clear that they're asleep and unconscious. Any of you ever been to a funeral where the minister says, well, we know they're all burning in hell right now. I've never been to one like that. Everyone always goes to heaven. It seems like they preach them all into heaven, no matter what kind of life they live. I'm telling the truth. It's not very pleasant to think about, but Jesus says, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. If, judging from the funerals that I've attended, everybody's going. 
Bible says they're sleeping until the resurrection. Amen? Number 12. Why did the devil lie to Eve about death? Could this subject be more important than many think? Yes, he's going to use it to deceive in the last days. See, the devil needs to pave the way for his demons to impersonate departed loved ones. I could preach Scripture all day long, and a lot of people will believe what they see with their eyes more than what God's Word says much faster. People say, I had an experience. I saw something. How many of you have read books or articles or seen magazines where people say they had a near-death experience or they had an after-death experience? They die on an operating table. And they'll write these stories about, I know you go right to heaven because I died and I was on my way to heaven and then I got up there and the angel said, well, we made a mistake. We called you too soon. That's what some people say. Or I know some other minister that says he died on the operating table and he was in hell. And the Lord said, I'm going to give you another chance. You've got sin in your life unless you repent. And he sent him back. Well, if you're going to build your theology because of someone's near-death experience when the supply of blood has been deprived from the brain, your theology is going to be really confusing. Because I also know people who say, I had a near-death experience, or I died on the operating table, and I was in a room with two tunnels and I went down one tunnel and there was a blue door and I went down another tunnel and there was a pink door and I got to decide whether I was going to be a boy or girl in my next life. People who believe in the new age and reincarnation, they use near-death experiences to prove their theology too. You're going to be really confused if you go by these things, friends. A good friend of mine who's a doctor told me and he worked a lot with heart operations. He said people die a lot on the operating table and he says they're not clinically dead and they, it may even go several minutes where their heart is not beating, and they'll have all kinds of hallucinations and visions, and they'll claim to levitate above their bodies and hear conversations. He says, it's very simple. The blood is not flowing to the brain, and they're hallucinating. Now, I used to scuba dive, and it's the same thing. You don't get enough oxygen, you start having near-death experiences down there, you know, 50 feet below the water. And so you cannot build your theology on someone's experience, friends, according to the Word of God. Amen? According to the law and the testimony. That's the only safe way to go. And you don't build it on dreams. You don't say, well, I know this is true because I had a dream. I had a dream one time that Jesus came for me. When I was living up in the cave, He came to take me to heaven. And He came in a bumper car. <laughs> you ever been to the amusement park and they got these bumper cars? Now, that was just a little personal thing between me and Jesus because I used to go to the amusement park and the rides on the bumper car were never long enough. And Jesus coming in a bumper car was, for me, a sign of the ultimate pleasure. We were going to heaven in a bumper car forever. And so, now, I'm not going to say, do you think I'm going to teach people, Jesus is coming in a bumper car because I dreamed about it, I know. And this is how people are building their theology now, their feelings and their, their dreams, and they die on the operating table. What does the Bible say? Amen. That has to be the foundation for our teachings. Number 13. Do devils really work miracles? Oh, yeah. How many of you remember in Genesis there, or Exodus rather, when uh, Moses came before the Pharaoh, he threw down his rod, it turned into what? A serpent. The Pharaoh commanded and his magicians came in, they threw down their rods and they turned into serpents. Moses' serpent, of course, ate their serpents and they didn't have any serpents or rods anymore, but hey, they could create illusions. Matter of fact, they were able to imitate several of the plagues until it was the lice. Once the lice came, they were scratching so hard they didn't have time to try and conjure those things up. But the devil is a master of illusion. And you might think, well, boy, I tell you, this ghost appeared to me and he knows things that only he knew and I knew. You're forgetting someone else who knew. The devil knew. The devil knows and sees these things. And he can really deceive you. He can pretend that he's Eleanor Roosevelt if he wants. Number 14. Why will God's people not be deceived? Answer. They receive the word of God with all readiness of mind. They search the scriptures daily whether these things were so. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Where are we going to go to get our information about what happens when you die? A Ouija board? Tarot cards? Crystal ball? 
I think I told you they got, just everywhere you look now, they got these psychics you can call and write to. And I think I mentioned to you, one of my friends called one of them up. First thing they said is, can we have your credit card number? He said, you're the psychic, you tell me what my credit card number is. People in North America, we're supposed to be a civilized country, are very spiritualistic right now, consulting psychics. And, you know, all the tabloids are covered with modern predictions. People are going everywhere for this information but to the Bible. And I think that's very dangerous, friends. Back in Moses' day, what did God command should be done to people who taught that the dead are really alive? Answer, the Bible says a man or woman who had a familiar spirit or was a wizard should surely be put to death. They were to stone them with stones. They were considered to be working in cooperation with the devil. Now, a lot of things that are done these days in the name of spiritualism are just tricks. You know, if, if you look closely, a lot of these psychics that claim to have supernatural ability it's just a lot of bamboozling and sleight of hand and tricks. Harry Houdini spent several years trying to expose these false psychics, and he exposed a lot of them, that they were just shams. But even though there's a lot of frauds out there, do not forget that the devil does have his representatives that do seem to have supernatural powers that he gives them. And they can make you see things and feel things and experience things. And friends, if you're building your foundation on anything other than what the Bible says, you are a sitting duck for the devil. I believe in the last days, friends, you're going to need to have such a firm faith on God's Word that you will believe what the Bible says rather than your senses. Jesus said in the last days the devil is going to go so far as even bringing fire down on the earth in the sight of men to deceive them. Jesus has warned us that the deceptions will be so convincing that if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. That's why we need to know. Jesus tells us the very first thing he says in Matthew 24 regarding his second coming, the first thing he says is, take heed that no man deceive you. For many will come in my name, saying I am Christ, and then deceive people. The devil is going to pull all of the cards out, pull all of the tricks out of his bag. He's been practicing for 6,000 years in the last days. And you will be a lot safer going through this time of trouble if you know that the dead are asleep. Amen? They're not communicating with the living right now. The living know they'll die, but the dead know not anything. Job tells us a man dies and his sons may come to honor. He does not know it. He does not perceive it of them. And I like it better that way, frankly. It makes me a little edgy to think that all of my dearly departed ancestors that might be in heaven are spying on me all the time. It's enough knowing God's watching all the time without Grandma Bachelor looking down. She's sleeping, waiting the resurrection and her reward right along with everybody else. The Bible is very clear, friends. I invite your questions on this subject, and I remind our friends that are watching, send for the lesson, and I think you'll find a lot of Scripture is in here that I haven't even had time to share. Number 16, will the righteous people who are raised in the resurrection ever die again? No, that's good news, friends. We're going to rise to live forevermore. For the Christian, death is not a period, it's a comma, because Jesus is coming to give us everlasting bodies. Number 17, belief in reincarnation is expanding rapidly today. Is this teaching biblical? No. Now, there is one reincarnation, you know. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. After that, you're going to get reincarnated for your reward. We'll all live again for our judgment and our reward, amen? But a lot, I used to believe in reincarnation. And it was the most frustrating thing in the world for me because I kept trying to figure out what I learned in my life before and I could never remember. And so what good was it? I could never benefit from whoever I was. And my mother used to hang around with a lot of folks who believed in reincarnation. It was amazing. They'd tell me who they were in their former lives. They were always somebody famous. Nobody was, you know, I was a poor beggar. There were, I was Cleopatra. I was Napoleon in my former life. You know, with all due respect to, peop to people that believe this, the Bible teaches that you are an individual, that you are not a mush of life that just keeps on coming back as molded clay again and again and again. You are a unique person that God made in His own image. Then there's no one else in the universe like you. And you, in this life, get to choose your eternal destiny. This life is your probation. 
reincarnation makes the devil laugh because people think, well, if I don't get it right this time, I'll just work on it next life. And the devil wants you to think that because this is the time to decide what you're going to do for eternity, friends. There is only one reincarnation in the judgment. That's it. This is our time to decide. Now is the acceptable day. Number 18, are you thankful that the Bible tells us the truth on this sensitive subject of death? Isn't this good news, friends? That the dead are sleeping a dreamless, peaceful sleep. You know how refreshing that is to know that when someone dies, they don't go right to hell and start burning? I've had people call me up just torn to pieces. They'll say, my son or my daughter, some loved one died and they died lost. Are they burning in hell right now? And I could point them to the scriptures that say they're sleeping right now. People have been driven to madness with the concept that as soon as someone dies, they go right to heaven or to hell. And if their loved ones are not saved, for them to think while they walk the earth, they're blistering in torment, that can drive a loving mother or father to distraction. God is good. He says they're asleep. Amen? Friends, find a pen and take down our 800 number and mailing address. We have a wonderful free gift that goes right along with what you're seeing and hearing today. It's the beautifully illustrated complimentary study guide. Our operators are standing by for your call at 800-835-6906. Make certain you give the title of today's study when you phone. And by all means, write us at Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Look for this address again at the end of today's telecast. Offer good in the U.S., Canada, and U.S. territories. Friends, I think you know that a camera lens is a little impersonal. That's why I want to hear from you. I treasure each one of your cards, your letters, your words of encouragement, and your comments. We also appreciate your prayer requests. Our office staff gathers every day to pray over each one of them. The address is Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. God bless you, and I thank you in advance.